Hi everyone, welcome to the Tech Entrepreneur on a Mission podcast. My name is Ton Dobbe and I'm the founder of Value Inspiration and the author of The Remarkable Effect. I'm creating a tribe of tech entrepreneurs that are on a mission to do something big and meaningful. I invite you to join the tribe as well, especially if you want to create change that matters and put your software business on momentum that you're proud of. The goal that I have with this podcast is twofold. Firstly, to inspire new forms of value creation by sharing compelling ideas and stories about the potential we can unlock when technology and people blend in the right way. And secondly, share experiences from tech entrepreneurs like you about what is required to create a remarkable software business and how to overcome the roadblocks to do so. The guest on my podcast today is Jacqueline Schaefer, founder and CEO of Clearbrief. I was doing a pro bono asylum case where I was representing a woman and her toddler. And in, you know, in those cases, it really comes down, there's a final hearing and it's life or death for these individuals. And so there was a moment at that hearing where I saw the judge was pretty like not inclined, really from the first moment we walked in, not inclined to find in favor of my clients. You could just sort of tell from his demeanor. But I pointed him to a sentence in my brief, which was like a 50 page, you know, intense legal, you know, document. That was what convinced the judge was seeing, he, he looked at the evidence, he looked at that report in the context of my argument and we won the case. This is Jacqueline. She began a career as a litigation associate at the New York law firm of Paul, Weiss, Rifkind, Wharton, and Garrison. She spent the majority of her career as an assistant attorney general in the Washington and Alaska attorney general's offices, where she specialized in appellate practices and complex litigation. Before joining the startup world, Jacqueline also served as an in-house counsel for the national nonprofit Casey Family Programs, where she negotiated agreements with the state courts across the country and managed impact litigation. She graduated magnum cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania and cum laude from the Boston University of Law. And today, she's the founder and CEO of Clearbrief, a legal tech startup that's on a mission to transform the legal writing process and create a more fair justice system. And that inspired me. And hence, I invited Jacqueline to my podcast. We explore what's broken in the legal tech market and that the focus is too much on the process and not the outcome, a more just legal system. Jacqueline shares her vision for a justice system and how she's carefully architecting a product that's both sticky for its end users, has a strong network effect and an ability to create a more fair justice system for all of us. She talks about the biggest hurdle that she had to overcome and what has been critical in her eyes to create a remarkable software business that has staying power. By listening to this podcast, you will learn four things. Firstly, why you should develop a strong evidence skill and avoid taking shortcuts in finding product market fit. Secondly, how to build a product that has staying power with its core users and put a smile on their face every single day. Thirdly, why it is key to connect the dots to the larger impacts we're inspiring to understand the true problem that we're solving. And fourthly, how to introduce meaningful change to an industry that has not changed in decades. Well, hi, Jacqueline. Thank you for making the time available today and being a guest on my podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. That's likewise. And I think that's, again, in the, the match that I sort of, when I was looking out, hunting for stories about the value that we can create when technology and people blend in the right way. And that's what I saw. I got triggered by a, I think, by a funding announcement that got out about your company, Clearbrief. And that's where I started to look into, hey, what are these guys doing? That's where a spark lit and I reached out and that's, hence, we're on the call right now. So we're going to talk about your company, Clearbrief, in a moment. But before we start, one of the things that I enjoy starting with is learning a little bit about you in a special way. But if you had to describe yourself in two or three words as an entrepreneur, what words would you use? Oh, good question. So I would probably say creative. I really pride myself on my creativity. I'm also a musician. And part of the mission of my company is actually to help lawyers sort of realize that what they're doing is a very creative process. And, you know, we should use tech to help with the stuff that will free us up to be creative. 
I guess I'd also describe myself as very focused. That comes from my training, I think, as a lawyer and just being diligent about reading in depth and learning in depth and really actually focusing on the evidence. So, yeah. And of course, like justice oriented, because that's why I became a lawyer. That's really the vision and the mission for the company is, you know, I never want to forget that, that it's not just about tech for tech's sake. It's it's about the end product, which is having a more just system. Nice. Yeah, and that's uh, that's also what what triggered me. And I liked like there's some of, some of these things like lawyers and being creative. Sort of, yeah, that stood out to me as well. well hence the, the conversation we're having here. So I saw that you get you on LinkedIn. It says you started the company in January 2020. Very interesting moment in time, as we all know by now. But you didn't know that by then. <laughs> Tell me a little bit, a bit about it. Like, what did you see? What was the problem that's was out there, but was broken in the market that required a solution like yours. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been practicing as a litigator, you know, an, an attorney, some of my friends who are, you know, corporate attorneys are like, you're a real lawyer who goes to court. <laughs> and really it was my you know, experience for the past 13 years that the way that you win a case really comes down to the writing that you're filing with the court. And even beyond that, it's what are you referencing in your writing? Because in the US, sort of the norm and the gold standard for when you file anything with the court is that almost every single sentence in that document should have a citation to either a factual source or a legal source. And I had just had this experience so many times that it's a wonderful creative process to brainstorm and come up with your, you know, your killer legal argument. But then there's just a slog of misery while you're like, okay, I've got to find the evidence to support everything that I'm saying. And so there's a whole existing sort of tech world around doing the legal research. But there really is nothing that was helping with finding the factual support while you're writing the brief, the argument, the letter. So that's the core idea that Clear Brief was built to solve. And it's really also based on a a really formative experience I'd had right before, you know, I started the company when I was doing a pro bono asylum case, where I was representing a woman and her toddler. And in, you know, in those cases, it really comes down to there's a final hearing and it's life or death for these individuals. And so there was a moment at that hearing where I saw the judge was pretty like not inclined really from the first moment we walked in, not inclined to find in favor of my clients. You could just sort of tell from his demeanor, but I pointed him to a sentence in my brief, which was like a 50 page, you know, intense legal, you know, document. And the evidence that I was talking about in the brief, which was a therapist report. And in that report, like the therapist was saying this, this was real trauma that, you know, in, in an asylum case in particular, it's really hard to find evidence a lot of times because people have fled their home country, so they don't have a lot of evidence. But True. that that was what convinced the judge was seeing, he, he looked at the evidence, he looked at that report in the context of my argument, and we won the case. And so I, I really was, you know, it was such an amazing moment as a lawyer where I felt like I really helped them. And the way that I did it was by, you know, it's the combination, right, of of the legal argument and the craft that goes into that theory, but you need the evidence and you need to be showing it to the judge. So that's really the core of what Clear Brief does is it, it surfaces so people can see that the source while they're reading your argument. Yeah. Fantastic anecdote. And it brings the whole, the whole thing alive in such a, in such a way that's, instantly see the importance of it so, yeah i mean that was that was such an exciting moment like i think we both cried <laughs> me and my class i can imagine <laughs> but isn't that what yeah. it's all about it's not only about crooks you know it's about justice and yeah i can i can completely understand that and i can i can also get to your point where you got your evidence and your you're going your, for your pitch that you're going to use in order to make the case and then that you have to go through that process of yeah, that nobody likes to do. And that's where technology can really help and like create solutions as one plus one equals three. And that's exactly the story that I'm looking for in my podcast. So, uh, so thanks for sharing that. What do you believe is the opportunity if we get, if we get this right? If, if, the, if the world starts to use clear brief, what will change? My vision is that the courts are also all going to be using clear brief. The writers are going to be using clear brief. 
And first of all, people will save hours and hours on average, about seven hours a week of tedious administrative time so that they will be less stressed, which believe it or not, is a big factor in why the justice system faces so many challenges right now. Everyone is very stressed out and it's, it's, there's a lot of administrative burden. So we'll significantly reduce that. And that then the most important effect will be that the decision makers can actually reduce, they'll be able to put aside biases and make decisions that are more fact-based. Because as you can imagine, it's easier to, if someone says, you know, the plaintiff said, blah, 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 without seeing the transcript of what the plaintiff said, there's a lot of room for imagination and the judge sure. might have an opportunity to insert their own biases. But if then they can actually look at the transcript, read that context, the judge is forced to grapple with like, okay, well, it you know, <laughs> looks like this is the answer. So I think we'll be able to have more fact-based decision-making in our justice system and more fair outcomes. That's what I was looking for, for that word fair, yeah, because that's, I think, the essence of this, the fairness of things. Well, it's interesting yeah, because there's, I think there's a lot of talk about AI ma- actually being used to make decisions, and that's not my vision for the justice system. It's more about, let's let AI bring us the information and do what, what computers are really good at, which is surfacing things and surfacing the information for us. But let's you know make sure that there's a human decision maker who can evaluate that. True, true. And I completely agree with that. That's where the real value is coming from because it's not that maybe AI, of course, can do a very good job at doing all of that, but humans can also do the other parts again. And if you combine it together, this we've seen, for example, in health as well, suddenly like a, a 92% hit for one angle and one in 93 on the other end becomes a 98 together. That's what we're looking for. Because that's just a fundamental shift. Really cool. So yeah, it's I, I understand the spark, the, the, the moment where that spark with you, when you decided, let's do this. Uh, was, was there any special moment, by the way, that, that you say, okay, en- enough is enough. Now I have, to, I have to go and do this. I think it was, you know, a, a series of just inching towards having the confidence to go for it and kind of learning, having different experiences in the startup world where I left my, you know, my, my legal job and started, you know, working on startups basically. And I had, I had this idea, but I sort of needed the courage just to say like, I can do it. I can, I have sort of all the background that I need, which it took, you know, it took a few months to really get there (laughs) and, and feel confident. But once you, once you start and really go for it, I think finding the investors and advisors who believed in me, and who helped me along the way. It was, I wouldn't say it's like one moment in time. It's just a series of, of growing sure. and, and learning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, this, this is always the thing. And I like the, like the word courage as well, because that's what it's typically all about. And typically this, the words or the belief, that the, the thing that you t- keep telling yourself, can I do this? And start a sort of waiting until all the stars have aligned. But they won't, you know, you have to start and get, yeah, and go after what you believe in. So, when I first joined, the, oh, sorry, I just want to mention one more thing, which is like when I first joined the startup world and sort of getting involved with it here in Seattle, I did sort of feel like people said, oh, you're a lawyer, you're, you know, you're risk averse, you're not going to, you know, <laughs> we, we look, you know, entrepreneurs are typically people who are, are not risk averse at all. And I found that so interesting because as a lawyer, you're, like, you're always, you really deeply understand risk. You're you're learning and making the best decision on the information you have. And so it's not that attorneys are generally risk averse. We're just, we, you know, we like to have the information and <laughs> and make good decisions. And we're actually True. trained on making decisions in gray areas. So I really leaned on that strength a lot, and especially in the early days. So for any attorneys who have heard that theme, I want to tell you. Like, oh yeah. Actually, I heard about it last week in my interview with the, the CEO of a company called Legal Monster. Oh, cool. Stine from Denmark. Similar things. He was also an attorney and <laughs> let go of those type of things. Let go of the risk. Just go and do it because it, yeah, those things crash in those worlds. Let's talk a little bit about from the start of the company until you start, you, you got your product together. What I'm always interested in also kind of in relation to the book that I wrote, Remarkable Effect, is I mean, how did you start? What decisions did you take in the product strategy to make it do the remarkable things that, that you wanted to do? I mean, at the end, it's about a thousand decisions, but some are more important than others. 
Any argument on this? Yeah. So I think early on, what the, the approach that I took in the first several months of the company was more about developing the underlying algorithm and testing that versus making it a full product that the end user could interact with end to end. So, but, you know, it, it was enough that we could get a strong signal as to like, for example, you know, I did a lot of networking and just talking to all the attorneys in my network and they were like, yeah, this is a huge problem. Like they would, you know, send me their briefs and the documents, the factual documents that they had cited to. And using our algorithm, we were able to spot errors. And, you know, again, it wasn't ready. It wasn't ready for them to like use it themselves and to end as a product. But we wanted to just start with, and you know, seeing if the algorithm could work. And we were finding that we were catching errors that people were making. And that even in this primitive format, we were, you know, able to deliver value. Let me make a small interruption here. Jacqueline just made a critical remark about her approach to ensure she was solving a valuable problem, a problem critical on the agenda of her ideal customers. Not by guessing what they'd like to have, or by throwing in a shiny polished AI tool. What she was doing was thoroughly testing the market with the underlying algorithm, something that was still far away from a ready-to-use product. And this is a trait remarkable software companies master. They focus on the essence, master the art of curiosity, and then validate. Validate until they have the strong evidence that they will deliver something that's highly valuable and desirable. This not only makes them more resourceful, but also helps them create their momentum. And you can master these traits as well. And I have various options for you to start. First, go to valueinspiration.com to learn about the masterminds and the work streams to put the fundamental building blocks in place to fast track the growth of your software company. And as you're there, don't forget to grab the free Kindle version of my book, The Remarkable Effect, to start sparking new inspirations in the next 30 minutes. Back to the interview. So that was a really, you know, really helpful signal that like, yes, we were, we were on the right track and it allowed me to raise like the first, you know, the first funding and hire my amazing CTO, who Jose Sauda, who joined Clearbrief after, you know, spending 20 years at, at Microsoft building, you know, cutting edge AI products. And so when he joined that really supercharged our ability to productize this and make it into something that what it is now, which is a product that you can use end to end within Microsoft Word. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's, it's part of the tools that these people use anyway. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was a big, yeah. a big decision that we, we also made to really go where like 99%, or it's like a ridiculously high percent of attorneys and judges in the US use Microsoft Word because it, you know, it's just ingrained <laughs> in the culture of the law here to use it for your legal pleadings. And so that's where people are, where they're writing, where they feel comfortable. So let's yeah. introduce the really cutting edge tech into that, that safe, happy place. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. When we, when we create technology, we always think, okay, it needs to be our interface and then we can do this better. But at the end, if you take people away from, from where the work really happens, the question is whether you will get the adoption that, you, that you're hoping for. I've seen a couple of big mistakes there already. So that's a very good, yeah, kind of yeah, underlying decision. And of course, it helps you also to make progress and focus on where you're good at. 100%. I mean, I think we take for granted Microsoft Word. The reason why it has such staying power as a word processing tool is that it does do very sophisticated things. And the legal world is an area where they need like special italics, special symbols, you know, that kind of level of sophisticated word processing. Like Google Docs still really hasn't gained wide adoption among the lawyers because it just, there's certain features it just doesn't have. And so, if Google couldn't crack, like <laughs> making a really good word processor, it seems like, you know, we'd better stick with, you know, let those yeah, of course. Yeah. companies do that part. <laughs> well, I mean, at the end, you know, you're a startup and you also need to, you need to be resourceful with your people. And where, where do you create, where do you put time in and, and where do you leave it? So exactly. this is, you get so much out of the box if you just leverage the power of that, of that platform. And they also happen to be there anyway. What has been a really hard not to crack in the development process possibly or kind of getting to market product market fit? Do you already have product market fit? Yeah. I mean, I think we have really strong signal in that regard because we are getting such, you know, really good usage, consistent usage from our early users. We're, we're already working with, you know, government agencies and about to start working with 
courts and yep. you know across the country basically. So the traction that that we've gotten so far being such a young startup really does show that this is an idea that lawyers are ready for. I think the hardest nut to crack actually has been certain aspects of the UI to be like it's it's funny because just making it so easy and intuitive for a group of people who have not had tools. So for example like like I said, I mean really litigators the kind of lawyers who go to court, right? Like they have hardly had any legal tech available to them. There's been, you know, advances in in doing the legal research, but that's not a complicated UI really like for that task. And here we're sort of like reimagining the process, creating a workspace for the attorney, not only to use while they are writing their brief, so they can instantly find the best pages from the evidence to support what they're saying, but to also finalize the document, do this, you know, table of authorities, create an interactive final version of the brief. Like we're introducing a lot of new modern things to people. And so what we're focused on right now is actually taking all the feedback that we've gotten from our users and tweaking our user interface to make sure that somebody who's coming in cold can instantly figure out how to use the tool. Yeah. That's the whole product-led growth thinking here. That's it, it requires almost no no touch to get people going and then grow from there. But what has been the, the hardest thing to do yet to crack in that whole game to get the adoption the, going? Oh, to get the adoption going. I think figuring out the right messaging has been tough. And I think over time, one of the cool experiences I've had recently was I did my first in-person conference that I never had done one before with ClearBrief, but a lot of legal tech companies have told me that that's how they they built the company from day one was going in person to these attorney events, talking, building relationships. So I did my first conference and I could see at the booth, like some people would start to walk by and be like, I don't want to talk to a salesperson, but then they would see our sign that had our value proposition on it. And they would stop and say, oh, okay. Oh, actually, hey, tell me about Clearbury. <laughs> like they would come over after they read the sign yeah. And that was really exciting because it was like, okay, they, the messaging is resonating, starting to resonate because we had to sort of figure out how do attorneys feel about AI? You know, do they want AI doing their work for them? Do they want, you know, something that feels like a paralegal that's a virtual paralegal helping them or something like that? Like we, we had to really test a lot of different ways to frame our value proposition. Yeah. Yeah, what was that breakthrough moment in that messaging? What did you change that started to, to suddenly resonate? Great question. <laughs> I feel like it wasn't like one one single change. It was a thousand changes. <laughs> you know, we would just test different things. And, of course. But I think focusing on the idea that we're helping you find that needle in the haystack from the discovery while you're writing it's such a common pain point that anyone who's had to do a lot of legal writing can experience. And the big trend of the whole legal you know, system, especially in the U S here is like you bury the other side in your discovery. <laughs> and there's just, there can be thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of documents and you do have to, you know, read it all first, but then there's this process where, okay, now you're sitting down to write and you've used your brilliant human mind to <laughs> consolidate and, and figure out what are the, the key points, but you can't remember where in the record you saw that. So we're, we're helping with that step where, look, you focus on that interesting high level thinking where, you know, you've, you've read everything. Now you're going to, you're sitting down to, to write your elegant argument. Let's build something that can help you just find the support for what you're saying. Cause you know, it's in there. So I think focusing on that, particular experience is it's so common among people who write for a living which is what lawyers do yeah i mean brilliant that you said so and if you've sparked already with the words that idea i mean people on the podcast won't see this but my chapter number nine in my book the 10 traits of what represents or what defines remarkable software companies they sell the idea not the product and then the last chapter of it is they surprise and hit the right nerve and exactly what you just said is all about that. And we forget about that in technology. We start kind of throwing AI at people and all the technical verbs. That's so cool. But at the end, it's the experience that they're buying and the outcome of that. Yeah. Taking them to that, to that world that they're hoping to be in. So it's, 
Great stuff. Great that you it's shared like why it. they became a lawyer. They, you, you didn't become a lawyer to spend, you know, seven or eight hours a week finding <laughs> page yeah, numbers. But, but you could, this is a good point as well. I mean, the moment we hear lawyer, we think these are people that decide based on facts, but they're humans. Yeah. So they make decisions with their heart as well. And, and like what feels to them, like that's what, what they, yeah, what they want and what they need. So, so often we make the mistake that because we think that a particular role is all about numbers and about facts and about evidence, and it's so untrue how they actually make decisions themselves. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well done. Well done. So what did you experience in this whole, in, in the sales process then? What is the lessons learned there? Yeah. In the sales process, I think it's, it's nothing like wildly new. I think it's really just building relationships is so important because lawyers, maybe more than other professions, I'm not sure, but there's been even like in recent weeks, some articles going around complaining about the tactics that are the sales tactics that are used to try to sell into small firms or large firms. And it's just, nobody wants to be approached in that way. And so it's trying to be creative about how you build relationships, how you, I think it, for me, I don't have any grand theory other than I like to just try to create interesting content that I would want to read. I am my customer. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Sure. I'm a litigator. Sure. I love to be you know, intellectually stimulated. And so a lot of ads and you know, sales materials are very cheesy and just never going to catch my attention. And so I try to think about you know, what, what, what's a phrase or what's a, an idea that would interest me. And I think we do have very cerebral customers. So it's, it's a very fun exercise and something that has turned into a really interesting part of my role, actually, as CEO, is helping to think through our content and messaging. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, of course, you're the spokesperson, you're the founder, but at the end, it's about evangelism as well. You know, this world is, is used to a certain way of working and you're taking, taking it to something else that's, at the end, a better, a better world, a better future. And that, of course, requires people to, to think, wait a minute, this is possible. And then you get them on the journey. I like what you were saying, what, what, that you were saying there. And sleazy sales tactics work on nobody. So well done. <laughs> well, well, one I mean, more thing I'll mention too is like the product itself has really strong network effects because one of the really? things that, that attorneys do, whenever you file your brief in a case or any kind of motion, pleading, you must serve it on the other side, right? And so in addition to filing it with the court system, what attorneys are generally also sending via email, a courtesy copy of whatever they filed. And so with Clear Reef, we can help them so that now they can just send a nice, beautiful, beautifully formatted link that the judge and the the other users receive. And they can view that filed brief with all that's fully interactive. So the reader can see the source documents for every single citation. And that is a very powerful (laughs) network effect because instead, you know, everyone would much rather do that rather than send a bunch of PDFs. True. So it's very exciting to see, you know, the response to that. So you not only kind of sell this product to be used by your customers, but it's also going to be read by everyone that is involved in the case. Exactly. I mean, that's what briefs themselves have their own network effects because we're all reading them, you know, in, in, especially in big cases across the country, people are trying to read the briefs and the opinions understand what's going on. So we actually did this recently for, there was a, a U.S. Supreme Court decision about abortion that was, everybody was reading and trying to understand how could the court come to this conclusion. And we took the opinion and we ran it through clear brief and made it fully interactive so that the average person can go in and see, okay, they're talking about this legislation. Okay, here's the legislation. They're talking about these cases and these statutes. Okay, here it is. So they can actually understand what the court has decided and actually look at the materials they were citing to. Fantastic. Yeah. And so do you already see a sort of a viral effect coming from this where people start to kind of tell it to their friends and their peers and Yeah, we saw a lot of people. It was very cool because we felt like we were helping the national dialogue. We saw people on Twitter sharing the interactive opinion that we'd generated with Clearbrief, people who were not lawyers, you know, because they wanted to understand too. The law is supposed to be a public good, (laughs) something that we can all access and read and ideally understand. But the profession has 
sort of evolved in a way that with the citations, it can make it very hard to follow for someone who's not trained as a lawyer. So we really do see this as, as having a strong, like democratic benefit that, sure. you know, if courts use clear brief, then it, it helps people understand what, you know, the ruling has been. Yeah. What is by design, by the way, or is it a surprising byproduct? Interesting. Well, so it, it definitely was always part of our thinking that we want courts to use it, but yeah, the network I, effects. Yeah. Oh yeah, yes. The network effects definitely were were by design, but we didn't think about use taking, you know, the the kind of decisions that were in the news and running them through Clear Reef until the Supreme Court was coming out with these things. So we're like, oh wait a minute, like we can use this to <laughs> to help the national inform the national discussion. So that was sort of something that you know we realized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, After that's that's true. <laughs> Specifically for those big cases that is, that are so emotionally loaded. It's yeah. great, great, great example. So, yeah, January twenty twenty. I mean, I have to ask the question. So you launched, or you started? And when when did you launch the product officially for availability or general availability? So it took a while. It wasn't until March twenty twenty one that okay, we actually sure. had the product that it was, was in a form that could be you know used. By the public easily, you know what I mean. So the entire, yeah, that entire period was spent really validating and testing the underlying technology, that the algorithm and the AI yeah. piece of this, and also really, you know, building the team and the investors and the advisors that allowed us to, you know, eventually launch in. I think it was in March 2021. We yeah, okay. we actually launched the product. But I will say it was extremely difficult to fundraise. <laughs> When I was getting ready to fundraise, it was like right after the pandemic hit. Yeah. But in some ways, I was also able to get meetings with people because everybody was stuck at home. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe maybe the net effect was was actually good, but what's been so validating honestly is is that I heard over and over from VCs early on that like legal tech, it's, you know, it's so difficult, you know, to sell in legal tech. It's just We're not interested. And in this past year, there was just an article that came out in Crunchbase that was like, VCs invest billions in legal. They finally understand <laughs> the value of legal tech. <laughs> there have been a number of just IPOs. And I think it's partly because during the pandemic, we saw law firms rush to legal tech and just it, there was a sea change of, of adoption. Yeah. So I felt, you know, really happy to see that, <laughs> that Crunchbase yeah, article. Yeah, yeah. It's something that you know, we had known was going to come. And I think, you know, we were well positioned to now take advantage of the yeah, they of say the They say timing is always everything. And sometimes you can plan for that. And sometimes it's just pure luck. And I, I agree with you. This whole world, of course, has been, yeah, the digital transformation in companies has, has accelerated 10x in ways that you wouldn't expect could, could happen. And I think that's, that's also true for, for the legal side. Because, yeah, these... You always have that if you see the courts and you see everything that's so non-technical there, mm -hmm. like, you know, it's, but now they had to, you know, it, it's like the virtual, the, the virtual cases and yeah, how do they share information, these type of things. So there, there must be a wave there. So glad it was yeah, an underlying, how do you say that groundswell almost to, to build up the wave behind you, which is another thing that I highlight on my book. <laughs> so. Well, and that, that's, that's what it takes, I think, to transform industries like, The yeah. courts and you know really we're focused on the legal profession in its its oldest you know <laughs> you know form which is the idea of you know due process getting your ability to go to court to make your case and that really hasn't changed very much and it's very very difficult to break in but because my most most of my experience has been as a government attorney you know briefing and arguing cases before the state supreme courts before the you know the appellate courts that's really what helped me see like, this is coming, this change is going to happen. This transformation is going to happen, but you need someone who can translate, you know, for those individuals and explain, you know, your core value and in, in what you do and your, the intelligence that you bring to the practice of law is not going to change. This is just something that's going to make your day-to-day -day less administratively burdensome. Sure. Exactly. So kind of, in relation to covid were there any obstacles that you didn't see come that yeah that sort of threw you off course that, that you had to go and come back were there anything that you had to do differently there interesting i think because of sort of where i was you know in seattle we were already planning to be a remote first 
startup. That really, I, I would say we didn't have any major negative impacts from COVID because like I said, it really changed, you know, it was hard to raise money, but it's, I don't know, it's hard to tell because it's very hard for women led companies to, in general to raise money, <laughs> to raise venture yep. capital. So I can't really say that we had, you know, a major difficulty. And in fact, it made it easier, like I said, to, to actually get meetings with certain people and True. to build that traction early on. Okay. Well, I mean, sometimes it's a big obstacle and it throws you off the path, but otherwise sometimes it can also help you, of course. That's how these things work. So what are you most proud of achieving so far? Maybe you've already talked about yeah, that thing that you did, but that was prior to the product, like the cases that you can really help to end up with a, with a fair outcome. Anything that yeah. the product has done to you so far? Yeah, I'm so I feel such pride when I hear back from our current users and like, you know, I just got an email like a couple of days ago where, where someone was like, oh my gosh, clear brief really helped me. It, because what one of the core things that we're doing is when you're getting ready to file your brief, someone has to go through and make sure everything is accurate that you've cited to, right? And this lawyer realized, oh no, like we were citing to this one statute and it was just sort of a typo and and we totally were not meaning to cite to that statute. And it was discussed in a whole big portion of the brief. And because Clearbrief pulls up the source document for you, he was able to see like, oh, wow. Yeah, this was a, a major mistake that <laughs> Clearbrief helped us avoid a big, I mean, it's, it's so embarrassing to file a brief and realize like you completely cited to the, long, the wrong law. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, you know, really stressful. So that kind of feedback, we keep getting that over and over and it's so validating. Another great, you know, piece of feedback that that we keep hearing is this idea that like you helped me when I when I I converted my opponent's brief into a word doc, ran it through Clearbrief, and I saw because Clearbrief highlights in red the places where this sentence does not seem to match with the source document that they cited to. And just simply flagging the in those places like, yeah, you should look at this. It doesn't seem like it matches that helped the lawyer think of a new theory, a new legal theory. Like, oh yeah, like they're lying. It doesn't actually say that. That is so, so exciting. And it feels like, you know, we really use technology in a way that inspired people that helped them write a better argument and be more accurate in the court. That is absolutely our mission and our vision. Yeah, that's what you, that's what you, what you started off, like the creative part and helping lawyers be creative as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's good that you that yeah, these things are coming out and that they're being recognized by the people that actually use the product. So I've referred to my book already, and it's about the 10 traits that define a remarkable software business. I mean, I'm always interested to hear the different perspectives on the topic. So what do you believe? What do you believe that you require as a company yeah, to create something that's memorable and that people keep talking about? What are essential traits to have? Yeah, it's so funny. My perspective on this has really changed from being an entrepreneur and building my own <laughs> company. I think before I did that, I would have said, oh, it's all about the technology. It's all about your AI. I actually don't think that at all now. I, I really think it's all about the, the user experience and yeah. whether they feel less stressed, whether they feel joyful when they use your product. One of the things that decisions that I also made that I hired an artist to make little gifts and kind of cartoons that that play at different parts of the product experience. And every time when we demo it, we get a laugh from the attorneys. They're like, That's so cute. What is that? <laughs> like we have this one little like floating avocado lawyer character. <laughs> and they're like, what? Okay. what is that? And, and it makes them laugh and it makes them smile. And I think bringing joy to your users and in delivering something unexpected in their day that makes them smile and makes their life less stressed that is how you build a product that has staying power exactly that people want to use that they keep talking about that memorable and it's these things that people talk about to others as well you'll never get there with the technology if people aren't motivated to keep using it True. so yeah. the technology yeah. is just a vehicle to get to a certain <laughs> point exactly and to to build a certain experience exactly as well yeah, I like the words that you use there, like the feel of joy, the feel of less stress. These are the outcomes that people value. Yeah. Just getting towards the end of the interview, since you now are an entrepreneur yourself, for at least the last two years, this is your first startup, right? That you founded. 
So I actually, I, right before this one, I co-founded a startup out of a startup incubator in Seattle. Okay. So that's what kind of yeah, exposed me to the, you know, the VC startup world. Okay. Mm-hmm. Didn't, didn't notice that part, but okay. Being an entrepreneur, what are, based on the tidbits of wisdom that you've gained so far, what does it do and what does it don't that you could, that you would like to share with other aspiring tech CEOs or people that actually want to, yeah, really make a leap again? Hmm. Yeah, I would say the biggest do is to just keep going and have faith in yourself and don't let the good news or the bad news phase you too much either way. So much of being an entrepreneur is just being clear headed and, you know, continuing on (laughs) despite, you know, crushing disappointment, despite people telling you, no, it's not possible. It's not a good idea. You have to really have faith in your, your vision. So I think that's the do is just keep going. And I think the don't is don't take shortcuts to finding product market fit in terms of, you know, don't assume things about your users. It needs to be based on evidence. Like literally that is what our product, you know, actually does in the world. (laughs) But when you as an entrepreneur are making decisions you don't want to just go with your gut. You know, I think you really want to try to gather evidence that's real and look at it, understand it, talk about it with your team, get other perspectives. That's going to guide you in a way that's sustainable. And I think also to, this is my lawyerly <laughs> perspective is like, like do things the right way. I, I've seen a lot of startups that take shortcuts with like security practices or, you know, user data or other things. And it's, it's best to, you know, get get some legal advice, <laughs> you know, sure. make sure that you're setting yourself up for building a really great company that has staying power. That's not going to cause you issues down the line with fundraising or things like that. Beautiful advice. I like that. I mean, the, the, there's so many shortcuts taken and it's just not good. And it maybe it's also got to do with a certain phase that your company in is in. I've seen it happening more and more with the larger companies that, that then start to focus after their growth on the profit side and that take the shortcuts there. But it's also true if you're a startup and it will only bring you further away from what you really want to be. Wise advice. So if you could ask anything to anyone that's listening to this podcast, what would it be? How can we help you? Oh, I would say who is the best UI, UX designer that you know? And... <laughs> Can you make an intro to me? I think one of the things that I would love to do is to get some more feedback and insight from different designers, because I think that's how we're going to land on, you know, the really amazing approach for some of the thorny challenges we're, we're looking at. So, yeah, I think that it's definitely a niche that there are a few people who focus on the justice system and legal design, that kind of thing. But I think that bringing in design expertise from different types of products is really yeah. valuable. So I, that's what I'm personally looking to have more of those kinds of conversations. Great advice to ask for. I mean, there's definitely, of course, people that have broad networks and then know, know the right people for, to, to do that. So yeah, last question, like where can people go to find out more about ClearBrief and to connect to you to say hi? Yeah, so they can go to clearbrief.com. Also clearbrief.ai will take you back to the, <laughs> the same place. And please reach out, email at hello at clearbrief.ai. We would love to talk with you about the law, your you know, you know, justice system vision, and how we can help make the legal world less stressful. Great. Thank you very much. And I mean, I really like the, the interview, the lessons that you've shared, the vision behind your, your product and business. I love the anecdotes at the beginning about you know, how it's really an emotional thing at the end and creating a more fair legal system. So I'm, I'm really an advocate of your mission there. Yeah, I mean, the wise lessons that you shared as well. I mean, I've made a lot of notes here and I'm hoping that people that are listening to this will do exactly the same. So good luck on the journey. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have it all figured out at all, but I am lucky to be able to have a lot of, you know, advisors and other people to to lean on. And so I that's my other, I guess, big piece of advice is find really great advisors who can be your sounding board. Yeah. You don't create strategy on your own and you need people that can give you the outside in perspective. I completely agree with that. So well, thanks and take care. Thank you so much.
And this ends my conversation with Jacqueline. And I hope you enjoyed it. And if so, please leave a review on iTunes. And if it inspired you, please share it with other tech entrepreneurs on a mission that you have in your network. Other than that, thank you for tuning in to this podcast. I had the honor to speak to Jacqueline Schaefer, founder and CEO of Clearbrief. As said, the goal that I have in this podcast is twofold. Firstly, to inspire new forms of value creation by sharing compelling ideas and stories about the potential we can unlock when technology and people blend in the right way. And secondly, share experiences from tech entrepreneurs like you about what is required to create a remarkable software business and how to overcome the roadblocks to do so. Before I close, I have two more comments to make. If you know other tech entrepreneurs on a mission that have a story worth sharing, please send me an email at ton.dobby at valueinspiration.com. Building the momentum all starts with revealing the ideas. And that starts with you. And if you want to know more about my book or you're interested in joining the Remarkable Effect tribe, please visit my website at www.valueinspiration.com. Thanks for tuning in. And you could do me a big favor by rating the podcast on iTunes or provide me with your feedback directly. I'll see you shortly on a new episode.